Arra kérek mindenkit, hogy foglalja el azt a pozíciót, seats, a and, uh, accept your position for the next 90 minutes to two hours, so you could spend your time comfortably. As I have promised, this next block will deal with a kind of perspective above the horizon of Eastern Europe, and we try to clarify the world political situation, and in that context, everything that has happened in Central Europe and in Germany at that time. As I said in the introduction, I am very grateful to Danube Institute so that they invited the Anglo-Saxon universe to us as well, because Charles Crawford, earlier British diplomat who also served in the Soviet Union and dealt a lot with matters Soviet uh, is with us, as well as Mr. Clark Josh, uh, President Reagan and Bush's advisor and uh, text, uh, text writer. But I'm also very grateful that we have among us Miss Maria Schmidt, Professor Maria Schmidt, about whom I don't think I have to say anything, how important and instrumental her role was at the time of the political change and how much did she do for clarifying the operation of the communist system and how much she, she produced in this respect beyond her qualifications and merits as a leader of an institution. And it's a special privilege and uh, luck that András Oplatka is also among us, about whom hardly anyone know. His tremendous the translators, journalists, and historians over. He also has been a journalist on Neue Zürcher Zeitung in the 1980s as a reporter in the USSR. So I suppose that this is again a very important factor and some added value to our discussion today. And the discussion will be initiated, uh, chaired by Zsuzsana Breyer, who I might say Zsuzsi is a very colorful Career, uh, had a very colorful career because she started the Germanistic Institute Chair of the University of Philosophy and from the Pilis Vereshvar Schwäbisch community to her way led to the Germanistic Chair of the University to Berlin Embassy of Hungary beyond Hessen's regional European Union matters and the position is on the secretary for this uh, district of Germany. So she has seen a lot of this world, and quite recently she has completed the job which dealt with the issues of 1989. She is documenting that. So welcome to us. Zsuzsi, the floor is yours. So let's start now. Thank you for the introduction. And also you, that you introduce the participants of this forum. Truly and frankly, so thank you very much. I welcome everyone, the participants at the panel. Uh, we shall continue now where we stopped at the pe previous one. I heard this great interest that Imre Konya spoke about disappointments, as Hubertus Knabe told us uh, his, about his skepticism in the context of the topic of our panel, whether we could learn from history and after that, Balázs Orbán gave us great pleasure by giving us six lessons to be taken home. So it's a quite a big picture, and I'm very happy, and I think it's right and just that the younger generation looks at confidence to the in confidence to the future. Now, if we take this 30th anniversary with this dual vision, and if I want to look at it in Germany and in Hungary and to try, find out, try to find out what we should do with this anniversary, one thing occurs to me immediately that in Germany, uh, they speak about 30s of uh, peaceful revolution. That is the title of every commemoration. And then there is a debate whether this was revolution at all, or perhaps it wasn't. In Hungary, nevertheless, the uh, title of this anniversary is owing to Maria Schmidt, who is 
in the government commissioner for the 30 years of freedom that we have been free for the last 30 years. This is freedom, which for us Hungarians has always been very valuable since 1948-1956 and ever. So that's how we override this program. This is a core idea of this program. So I think this is a very important difference. So my first question goes to Maria Schmidt, because she says in this program that we return to freedom, to the free Europe. And my first question is somewhat provoking. What was that was fulfilled from this? What did we expect from this freedom, from this return to Europe? And what is that has been happening? And what is that caused disappointment? Thank you very much for the floor. It's an honor that I can be here and to speak about this very important topic. Uh, first, the word of praise. I am pleased that Germany has reached the stage when we can speak about peaceful revolution and not Wende, which has been turned, which has been quite a long time, a definitive feature of the disco, German discourse. I am very happy that the Chancellor gave uh, an interview to Spiegel, the magazine, where for the first time she said that the Berlin Wall and its collapse was the work of the East German people, and that it was their achievement, and they were the ones who accomplished this. I am not really satisfied in all details of this and the use of the word or the language as well, so there are a lot of things which we have to do, but these are two very positive items to speak of. What I would want to speak in some detail to return to the question, first of all, what has happened in 1989-1990, how to see them now, 30 years later, and how do I see this? And these 30 years which has elapsed since, what do they mean for us, and how do we see them? And even more so, it's important to discuss this because, because uh, there is a very great uh, lack of understanding between the West and East Europe. And Hubert Skanabe spoke very plastically about this and to very much detail and very thought, in a very thought-provoking word, not only by the statue of Marx, but also that practically in Germany as well, there is an increasingly strong division between East and West as it is happening all over Europe. And this is increasingly a kind of uh, gap or ravine, if you will, which should be very good to be overcoming and to bridging, as it were, and to reduce the distance between the two. My personal opinion is that the Western ally did not appreciate, for the very reason that was mentioned before, because it is leftist, it's Marxist, it's uh, non uh, because they conceive the world as a kind of ideological place, such, uh, using such ideological glasses which shade their view. So they don't understand what has happened in 1989-1990. In my understanding, it happened that the nation won over the class. And these were national liberational movements, really, or fights, if you will, which in Hungary, by the second half of the 1980s, we have been fighting. and. In some places it was started earlier, but the first and most important objective of this struggle was to re reconquer our history, the regaining of the national symbol that has been mentioned by Imre, and when we have regained our history, which was very plastically visible from the Hungarian event because it happened on March the 15th and October the 23rd, and so on and so forth, the national symbols, the flags, the banners, the symbols, and then the nation came forth and we fought a national fight against the Soviet Empire, the Soviet Empire of uh, conquerors, and we revolted against it all over the region, such as in Hungary, peacefully, but with the Czechs some blood flew, in Romania a lot of blood flew, and as, as a, that was the essence of the fight everywhere. The Western simply uh, thought that the national issue was no more there. It uh, was gone on in the Soviet Union from 1917 for 70 years resolved. And that the Soviet Union 
Okay, that was another important element, that an anti-communist national revolution was against the Soviet Union, did not want communism again, did not want it anymore. Everyone was fed up with it. So the fact that the communist system collapsed, this the West could somehow understand. But the fact that the nation would dismantle the whole thing, the very Soviet Union to pieces and shreds, uh, that was a surprise for all. Nobody would have thought that, although there were thousands of people who were dealing with the Soviet Union, the Kremlin's politologists and all, but nobody predicted that because each and everyone accepted the, the argumentation that the nation did not matter anymore, and that's a foregone conclusion. If we understand and see that 30 years ago there was an anti-communist national liberation move, fight which we fought in this region, then you should not be amazed that we don't want now to be en ingrained into an empire and we don't want to abandon our national sovereignty. That's one part of the answer. And the other is that these 30 years offered a lot of experience for us, which we gleaned together. And one of the most important experience is that the collapse of the empire was survived. We survived it. It did not bury itself under, uh, under, under itself, us under itself. Other empires did collapse, and it brought about much more severe consequences as a rule. So we are capable of standing up to learn the new world. And Chancellor Merkel also speaks about this in her interview. I recommend everyone to read this, that we have been capable of learning the new world, the market-based economy. We were capable of regaining our own institutional structures the constitutional statehood and its institutions that we all had before we have been integrated into the communist camp. So that was the other side of the equation. The third very important part was that the change of the political system, which we do have to find that particular language equivalent by which we can express all this that, I have, that he has spoken about. So as a consequence of this, when it was about what would we love if when the Russians will have left, and what would we want of the democracy, then the Hungarian allied, and that was always so, and in all other ex-socialist countries, they all desired normality, so that it should be just the same like the West. This pursuance of norm, this pursuance of the model became the most dedicated representatives were the past communists and the liberals. And by 1994, so that to respond to the question, react to the question of Gergely, it seemed that they could better represent that particular follow of the norm than the MDF, Hungarian Democratic Forum government, which in many respects emphasized the specifics. This particular following of the norm kept this allied in power until 2008. In 2008, the Hungarian nation finished the following of the norm because it took us into the ravine. And the demand was formulated in Hungary at us and everywhere that innovative responses were needed and new solutions and proposals for solutions because the, the, there is nothing to follow the Westerners for because they don't know where to go on the one hand and on the other hand they are still in the gap. So this past communist, communist allied in which the liberals were included, was unable to renew itself. They were unable to try and find another solution. And this had been so to this very day. And as a response to this came illiberalism, or rather the idea that we follow our own route. And we do not only emulate in a Slovene way or a servant's way of the Western model. And that's what has been happening since 2010 till now. So. The 30 years are full with success, it stops, as it usually goes. Nobody is perfect ever. This hasn't been perfect even. But all in all, in my view, we are in order. Now we are living in a successful period. And we completed the 20th century as winners. And now we are here. We are free. We are independent. We bear responsibility for ourselves only. And I think we do it well. So that is my my, if possible, evaluation of this last 30 years. Thank you very much. I was somewhat lengthy. Thank you very much. This uh, comprehensive uh, 
outlook, which uh, well, this is what the uh, question was also like, but it included a very uh, clear uh, opinion. I would like to take just one thing. You mentioned, Maria, that anti-communist attitude uh, uh, was something uh, that the uh, West understood, but they did not understand the collapse of the empire. My next uh, question is to Mr. Clark Judge, who is a speechwriter and a journalist. He was the advisor uh, to uh, Hungarian uh, to the American president. So Europeans did not think that this system can uh, collapse. So you remember that also politicians before 1989, they mentioned that the status quo will remain the division, will remain nothing will happen here. The system only will be consolidated. But when George Bush in January 1989 had his uh, inauguration speech, he sent some very encouraging words to Eastern Europe, which we never uh, do what's right. Freedom is right. Um, so these for us were absolutely straightforward words that it's worthwhile to uh, uh, fight for. So at least someone knew that what we were uh, fighting for. And then in May, uh, Bush in Minds became more concrete because he mentioned that we have been waiting for 40 years uh, to have the Cold War stop. At that time, nobody knew that the uh, communism will collapse. This is also what Bush said. The time is uh, ripe. Um, Europe belongs together. So this is why I'm asking uh, Claude Judge. So what was the atmosphere like? Uh, uh, did uh, uh, the American policy expect uh, that the system will fall, the system will grow down, and so that the division of Europe and the world will stop? Well, thank you for that. Um, you seem to have two voices. Uh, <laughs> the, um, the answer there is that it depended on who you talked to, with whom you talked. There were people in Washington who thought that the, uh, uh, the Soviet Union would go on forever. The CIA did. The uh, State Department did, by and large. It's uh, certainly the Foreign Service. Journalists did, if they weren't conservatives. But um, let me give you a, uh, you know, but Ronald Reagan? Well, before he became president, Ronald Reagan was having, as uh, Ed Fulner reminded me last night, and Ed is one of the great heroes from an American pr uh, perspective of the Cold War, having led the Heritage Foundation, the most important uh, uh, think tank in the United States, perhaps in the world in that period and now. So, uh, but as Ed reminded me last night, uh, Reagan and, and his then national security advisor, who's still a governor, uh, or he'd been a governor, it was between that and his presidency, uh, uh, was a fellow named Rick Allen, uh, Richard Allen, was, uh, was questioning him and, uh, uh, and preparation for work they were doing and for the campaign. And he said, well, Mr. Uh, Mr. Reagan, or governor, as they called him then, um, uh, do you have any sort of conceptual thoughts about the uh, dealing with the Soviet Union? And he said, yes, I, I do, although, although Richard, uh, they, uh, they may say this is a little simple. We win, they lose. <laughs> and and that, uh, and, and the, uh, Richard Allen also told the story, told me the story, of when he and Reagan in the pre preparation for the 1980 campaign visited Berlin. And um, they were standing at Checkpoint Charlie, which you know was the American uh, controlled crossing point. And Alan was looking and Reg uh, Reagan was looking. And then Alan looked over at Reagan and he could see that Reagan had barely concealed, uh, contained fury. This was a, a wrong, a moral wrong, a human wrong, and it would not stand. And that was the view of Ronald Reagan. 
Now, it it's, was true in the Oval Office, is true. Later years, I uh, talked to somebody who had just come out, and he said, well, I made some remark to him about uh, the Russians and uh, the Soviets and this going on forever, and he said, uh, I don't think so, said Reagan. It's against human nature. And so, in our side, that wasn't a view that was restricted to Reagan. It may have not penetrated the permanent parts of Washington, but things never do. Um, but it was very much within the ranks of the pe people who went to Washington with Reagan that that was what was going on. This was something that was morally wrong, it was uh, in any human sense wrong, that it was contrary to, foreign, uh, to human nature, and more of a, uh, there had been a long run up in American thought about uh, the character of the uh, of the um, um, uh, of the Soviet regime and also of its strengths and weaknesses. And play magazines like uh, National Review, William Buckley's, or Commentary, Norman Petortz's. Uh, there had been debates over uh, um, where, uh, what, what, how formidable, and could this be brought down? And there was a developing consensus in uh, those quarters that yes, it could. It was fundamentally weak. There was a whole um, effort in the um, uh, driven from these quarters to get what was called a Team B assessment of the uh, uh, of the Soviet Union. Team A was the team the, uh, that the foreign policy establishment had put together for long-range planning, and it took this uh, kind of um, materialistic view of the Soviet Union. Uh, it's working well. A famous economist uh, uh, named John Kenneth Galbraith, who leftist economist, said, "Oh, that this is shows that this is, there is a way to rationally run an economy. Apparently, there's a way to rationally run an economy into the ground." I would say, but uh, he was. They were very good at that. But, uh, but the Team B came back with a very different view, that there was real uh, weakness there and that there were problems there and there were problems that uh, they just uh, had reached the end of, of uh, their ability to cover up. You may recall that early on in the... Um, uh, in the uh, uh, administration, the president uh, did several things, one of which was to uh, cut off uh, funding for um, uh, the first pipeline going west. Uh, we're now facing a Nord Stream 2 issue, but for cutting off the, uh, uh, which uh, that shouldn't be built, but that's another matter for another conference, uh, uh, not to get an advertisement in there, uh, but uh, that there there um, was uh, uh, funded. There was um, uh, there were favorable terms on the table for building nor uh, for financing the building of Nord Stream 2, and he took those terms off the table. There was not going to be a, a, an implicit subsidy anymore for any part of the Soviet Union, and that was part of a general strategy which had to do with. Take it with um, building on the uh, his his weak the weaknesses he perceived his team perceived all of us perceived in the Soviet Union. If you take away the subsidies, if you force them to uh, deal, if you push up, uh, if you put in uh, a strategic defense initiative. Remember that after the uh, Soviet after the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, that uh, the uh, uh, Soviet Union's uh, 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 military apparatchiks uh, vowed that they would never be outgunned by the Americans again, and they spent the next 20 years uh, building a first strike capacity. And the idea was to be able to have a way of blackmailing us, and that uh, their attempts to uh, um, uh, get in a um, um, mid-range uh, nuclear uh, capacity, delivery capacity, was part of that. They wanted to be able to uh, strip away the uh, uh, the um, 
uh, legit the uh, confidence with which Europeans viewed the nuclear uh, deterrent in Europe. The idea of the uh, SS-20s, if you recall that, was that they could be shot from within the Soviet Union but could not hit the United States. So the United States would be put at a dilemma if they attacked Russia, if the Russian, if the Soviets attacked Europe, which was that are you going to trigger an attack on uh, on the United States homeland with something uh, in response to something that could not respond to the uh, hit the United States homeland? And the answer was put in the Pershings, which were based in Germany, and uh, those cannot. Uh, also can reach basically uh, into maybe the eastern areas, of the, uh, western areas of the Soviet Union, but not very far, and into uh, um, uh, Central Europe, and that that would remain to maintain the deterrent. And uh, so this was all part of the broad chess game that was being played economically, strategically, to uh, by by uh, maintaining that. Um, uh, deterrent, what did it do? It made the our anti-missile systems, what were they uh, the, uh, that were uh, in, uh, that Mr. Reagan announced he was going to develop? What was the purpose of them? To eliminate that first, the, uh, the confidence they had in that first strike capacity. In other words, to make this, they had spent all this money and all of a sudden we were going to make that, uh, the, that money obsolete. They could not get a strategic advantage from it. They could not blackmail us and blackmail Europe. Uh, and and uh, this was critical to that period. People said, well, you know, some missiles might get through. But a, a first strike capacity uh, depended on the confidence to wipe out all of our retaliatory capacity. And by creating doubt about whether they could do it, the first strike capacity no longer existed as a first strike capacity. And so we see all of these. We see at the same time uh, all that you know about firsthand in Poland and Hungary, else their parts of Eastern Europe. And we see uh, uh, the embrace of uh, the president and the pope, which John O'Sullivan, along with uh, Margaret Thatcher, uh, John O'Sullivan and has written so uh, insightfully about that spirit as well as material was a big part. What's what he was doing, uh, John was doing, it was what I was doing, it was what the Pope was doing, not that we're equivalent to the <laughs> Pope, but uh, that uh, we were doing in terms of writing what Mrs. Thatcher wanted and what Mr. Reagan wanted. We were appealing to the spirit of freedom. We were saying that you are not a alone. That was our central message. You are not alone. We are with you. And uh, every Reagan speechwriter has a story, and I, I, I do, every one of my colleagues does from the eight years, of some dissident, often from Poland, sometimes from Hungary, sometimes from uh, other parts of uh, Eastern Europe, uh, of Central Europe, coming up to us and saying, you do not, and, and of uh, Russia, uh, Sharansky said it to me, you, you, um, the, um, there, th you have no idea, they said, every one of them said, when we were in prison, when we thought there was no one supporting us, when we were under, uh, under constant uh, uh, oppression, we the dissidents, your words kept us going. Now, um, did, what, did this, uh, I, I'm, thought, I'm in very, very s simple strategic terms, uh, there was a moment, it was during, uh, I believe it was during the Washington summit, which was 88, and um, the, um, um, a lot of American conservatives were unhappy with how the president had subtly shifted his position from confrontation in the first term as we moved into the second term. Uh, being embracing of the Russians, particularly after Mr. Gorbachev came along. He agreed with Mrs. Thatcher that there was something that could be done. He also believed that they were at a breaking point. And our strategy in that period was 
to keep the pressure, keep the things that were pulling them apart, uh, keep that going. But the leader to leader was embracing. We will show you a way. If you want to change, we will show you a way. We will show you how to become a, a normal country. We will help you with that. And in essence, we were saying, you'll be hearing voices inside the Soviet Union from your generals, some of them, from your apparatchiks, some of them, saying, don't trust the Americans. They'll be at our throats. We must, we cannot relax. We cannot let this, uh, the empire go. We cannot do anything like that. And we were saying, come with us, walk with us, and we will, there will be a safe way for all of us to walk together. There was a moment when um, there were a lot of American conservatives who didn't quite get this. I thought it was pretty obvious, but uh, that, who didn't quite get this. And there was a dinner party at the house of one of them uh, about the time of, this, uh, of the 88 summit in Washington. And a number, a number of journalists, uh, conservative journalists, and, and they were, you know, you are being much too, too embracing of Gorbachev. You're letting him take credit. You're letting, there was a sign, by the way, on President Reagan's desk that he put there the first day he was in office. That sign said, it doesn't matter how far, uh, if, I'm sorry, it, there is no limit to how far a man can go or what he can achieve if he doesn't care who gets the credit. And they were saying to him, you're letting Gorbachev, sorry. just two seconds. Yeah, oh, but you I, have to I push I... again. <laughs> oh, did you hear that? <laughs> The, um, and it doesn't, it doesn't uh, there's no limit to how far a man can go or what he can achieve if he doesn't care who gets the credit. And the journalists were, the conservative journalists were saying, you're letting Gorbachev come here and take bows and get credit. And they were really bagging on him. And then one of them, a man named Ben Wattenberg, who was an important figure in that time, um, and a great figure, uh, said, had a kind of flash of insight. And he said, Mr. President, are you telling us what's going on here that you are, without saying it, telling us that, the Russia, that we have won the Cold War? Reagan was silent. He said, Mr. President, did we, have we won the Cold War? Reagan was silent. Mr. President, give us an answer. He gave a one-word answer, yes. So you ask, did anyone in Washington think? Well, the people who will tell you that they were the thoughts of the government, the people at the intelligence community, the people in the diplomatic community, the journalists, they'll say, oh, what a surprise. But the people who were with the president, and who understood spirit as well as material, and understood that spirit determines material, those people said, yes. Mr. Judge, uh, um, thank you very much for this uh, answer. I think this, uh, I think this reconfirmed us. This re reconfirmed us that uh, the United States has uh, uh, tremendous uh, uh, merits in making the fall, the Berlin Wall fall, and uh, not only Reagan and Bush, but also their speech writer have a uh, great merit as to uh, what was the out and ending of the Cold War. We heard from Balazs Orban that we can make a difference between the truth and the lies. And uh, this is uh, what uh, you mentioned, that the Americans can make a clear difference between freedom and oppression. We very much uh, and very highly appreciated this. 
I am actually quite concerned because this is what I hear today in Germany, and this is what Hubertus Sknabe also mentioned, that in the end of the Cold War is due to uh, Gorbachev. Uh, Mr. Oplatka talked to Gorbachev, talked to Genscher, talked to Nemeth Miklos and all the main players and actors of this period of time. So what do you think about this? So that without Gorbachev, the war could have never fallen. I think that you, in one of the, your books, have given an answer to this. So the first crack on the wall is something that we made. But I would be quite uh, curious as to how do you evaluate this from your personal uh, experience? Uh, I guess I ought to speak briefly as a first speaker because we want to have some debate as well yet. It is, there is a merit, and we should not go on about that for long. Ronald Reagan has a great achievement in as much as with his rearmament program, he presented to the USSR that the Soviet Union would not be able to emulate that techni technologically, and with that he put the Soviet economy and the Soviet state to its knees. The George Bush Sr. has great achievements too, who in uh, 1989, 1990, and this has not been done by all European heads of government. He immediately stood aside the German reunification and he gave his support to that. Mr. Gorbachev has also credits to him, and I see it somewhat differently as it was said in the previous panel by Hubertus Knabe. I think he has a great accomplishment in as much as Gorbachev. carried on a politi policy without violence, and he let everything flowing on in Central Europe without uh, trying to intervene, although he could have done that at this time. Uh, Helmut Kohl also has a call also a great credit to him, who at the right moment has recognized that this was the moment when the so-called opportunity window is open, and who knows for how long. And he was the one who had courage to exploit this immediately. And at last, I think that a very great credit goes in this small country to the then Prime Minister, Miklos Nemet, who undertook the risk to open the border. If his head led to a tragedy, his head would be would have been claimed, his head would have dropped, and the opening up of the border was not happening on August the 19th in Sopron, but rather on the 10th and 11th, and in September at Hegyeshalom, the Hungarian border. It was not Jula Horn who opened the border, as it is said in Germany, or believed in Germany by many even today, and the saying is false, which was said in Sopron that we here opened the border, and that was the major moment which in the, essentially led to the reunification of Europe and Germany. The Chaperon event was very important, no doubt. It accelerated the government's decision-making process because the pressure was applied on the government, but the credit, and that's why I call Miklos Nimet how a uh, small country was, whose prime minister he was. What has happened then perhaps only accelerated in some views, and it's difficult to date it with that. Uh, the, the impasses, it gave the impasse to German re re reunification. I think that it's important to clarify all when we speak about lessons to learn and experience to speak about, but how could we live in our present? We had, it's important to clear up who had what kind of a role in the collapse of system. Or like the leader of Solidarność, said that according to his view, one half of it was owing to the Pope that the communism collapsed. Thirty percent up to Solidarność and uh, these major statesmen, Gorbachev, Reagan, and Kohl, only had something like 70 percent in this equation. 
I want to ask Charles Crawford. He is a specialist of Russian and Soviet policy. How does he read the role of Gorbachev? And with that, we shall give a kind of response to what was raised by Andrei Shoplatka a moment ago. But I also want to carry through with this question, not only to learn to whom it was owed, but what collapsed in 1989. This will lead to our next set of questions. What was the communist dictatorship for the most uh, typical feature? Uh, thank you. The, um, it was in about 1985 or 6. I was working in the um, planning department of the Foreign Office, sort of speechwriter. And uh, Mr. Gordievsky, some of you know, the former KGB, very senior person had been working for us, he defected. So he came to London, was living there, and I asked if I could go along and meet him. And I went along with uh, a member of MI6 to meet Mr. Gordievsky. And I, we were talking about Gorbachev and, you know, what was happening, the Vladivostok speech, all this stuff. And I said, can you tell me what he really thinks? What does he believe in? And uh, Gordievsky, who knew Gorbachev very well, said, Gorbachev basically thinks that if the Soviet Union is a car engine, and if you take out vodka and put in petrol, the car will go very fast. And so I said, so what, you, what you're really saying is he believes in witchcraft. And he said, yeah, he believes in witchcraft. And I say all this because it, it, I get the impression from everyone who's talked so far, more or less, that we're talking about the end of communism. But we aren't talking about the end of communism. We're talking about the end of the Soviet, very stupid form of Russian imperialism, which, you know, wrecked most of Russia and wrecked certainly a lot of Europe for a very long time. There are great sweeps of ideas in all this. And one of the big, big, big ideas is, can society be planned? Or, or does society emerge? And this is a result of the Enlightenment. You know, do you need to plan things? We're very clever. We've, we're enlightened. Should we use that cleverness to build things deliberately? Or should we just let things emerge? And, and so I think when communism ended, I have sort of have a feeling that we in the West, and probably also in the East, we didn't really understand communism. And we really, in a funny sort of way, we didn't understand capitalism. In the Foreign Office, we'd never had to think about it. You know, where does it come from? It's just there. You know, someone wants to open a business, you go and open it, and you buy their stuff, or, or you don't, and they get richer, or they go bust. I mean, it was just sort of happening. And that whole thought had been stopped by, by a sort of Marxist, communist approach to, approach to life, really. And so when, when it all ended, I don't think... I mean, Mrs. Thatcher, Charles Poles here, Lord Pole, I mean, he, I think he took... Mrs. Thatcher took Gorbachev to a British supermarket to show that you could actually organise a society without central planning and there would be food. I went to Moscow in 1985, there was no food. How could it possibly be in central Moscow, in Tverskaya, Ulitsa, that there was no food? You know, there's a few tins of fish and one or two eggs, and there were no... There was nothing to pack the eggs in. If you wanted an egg in central Moscow, you had to take an old newspaper and wrap it up and hope that half of them would get home with you. So, you know, the sort of depth of the stupidity in all this, I think, in a way, overwhelmed us in the in the um, you know in the West trying to trying to work out what to do about it. And so I think when you think did communism end, communism didn't end, folks, because communism is an attitude to us. It's an attitude to planning. It's an attitude to philosophy. And um, you know you see these movies when there's a big monster, and they you know there's a battle and the monster is killed. And the last shot of the movie is something wriggling in the corner. You know there's going to be a sequel. <laughs> Communism was like that. And the huge, huge, huge mistake, and I don't know whether it was consciously thought about in Washington, was when communism ended, we did not insist that Lenin's tomb be demolished. This is a shrine to 
the darkest, darkest thing in world history. You know, the, when you talk to Russian diplomats about this, when they really get angry and when they really have nothing to say, is when you say, how can you explain the fact that this regime killed your relatives? And you're sort of trying to make apologies for it. Isn't this a bit dark? And they sort of start spluttering and get very sort of angry with you for raising this awful question. But Lenin and all those communist heroes are still buried there. The people who murdered, the relatives of the people queuing up to go in the tomb, that is still there. That's a complete sort of psychological dysfunction beyond anything really else on planet Earth. It's a baffling thing. So that hasn't really gone away. We didn't, you know, at the end of the vampire movie, you have to put the stake through the vampire's heart, otherwise it just comes back again. And so we didn't do that. We, there, was, there was plenty of, qu quite a lot of shock. There was, there was quite a lot of therapy. But maybe not enough of both. And um, I don't know, the, the, I always used to talk about the perfect murder, you know, in British detective stories. You have all these Agatha Christie or whatever, people writing about the perfect murder, where someone has sort of done it and you can't figure out the clues as to who that perfect murderer was. The really perfect murderer is the person who murders your relatives and he's there in the cocktail party with you and you don't mention it. That's the perfect murder because they've killed your soul. And these people have got away with that. And we in the West, in one way or the other, have let them do it. After this uh, passionate anti-communist uh, speech, I give the floor to Klaus and then Mario Schmidt. You know, you're absolutely right. Um, may I say Ambassador Crawford? I'm t he told me that uh, in the British Foreign Service you don't get to keep that title, but in the American, yes, in the American you do. So Ambassador Crawford. Thank you, sir. You're absolutely right, but. And the but is kind of important. Uh, why did Germany and Japan turn around so completely? Because we were occupying them. And, uh, you know, it's sort of like the mouse that roared. The thing you most want to have happen is for the United States to take you over. Uh, I'm not suggesting anything. But, uh, but we were giving aid, but we were also uh, basically uh, letting the democratic elements come to the fore. You couldn't do that with Russia. Uh, all of us, could, uh, all the allies could have been together, we just, that was not in the cards. The great achievement of this was to, uh, to have the end of the Cold War, as Margaret Thatcher said at uh, uh, Ronald Reagan's funeral, to have the Cold War end without firing a shot. Now, there were a lot of shots fired between the end of the first, uh, Second World War and, and uh, the fall of the wall, wall, but nevertheless, the point stands. And so, uh, the, the great tragedy is, or maybe not, the great work in progress is that we weren't given a circumstance in which we had, if you will, the millennium in the morning. We had a circumstance that was unfinished. We have the tragedy right now of a Russian president who thinks that the end of the uh, Cold War was a disaster. But life isn't over and opportunity, opportunity remains. I welcome Prime Minister Edmund Stoiber. It's, uh, we are so glad that his route from Bichke took to us so fast.
Wir hoffen, Herr Stoiber, dass Sie ähm, in Ihrem Vortrag dann alles, was wir hier auf dem Podium nicht I hope in, in the form of your presentation, you will tell us everything which we could not discuss so far on the podium and we could not resolve. So please be so kind and give us a summary. But first of all, allow me to make a short concluding round because Mario wanted to make some comments. There was a person who was not mentioned and who played an important role in uh, that the West won the Cold War led by the United States, and that was Edward Teller. And let's not forget about him because he had not processed the Star Wars plan, the SDI plan, strategic defense initiative. Then the in the rearmament race, the Russians wouldn't have been left behind. Edward Teller was a true Hungarian patriot who deserves that his name be mentioned. The second thing is, Zhuzhi, you said two times that the collapse of the wall and the uh, collapse of the system. The wall did not collapse and the system did not collapse. We demolished the war and we turned the topple the system. Millions of people were on the streets, not only in Solidarność in 81, but in Hungary as well. Hundreds of thousands of protests, uh, people protests were there. The Romanians uh, paid in their blood. So let's not presume that we all had all this as a gift. For this, the people here took a very great risk, and it's really significant the role they had played in it. And one last sentence, Norman Podhoretz, whose name was mentioned, who was the the editor-in-chief of commentary for 30 odd years, one of the most significant on the communist paper in the United States. He, at the, at the 10th anniversary of the political change, had a presentation in Budapest, the title of which was, We Have Won the War. Why don't we, why aren't we able to celebrate it? And this is the only question I can repeat 30 years later. Why are we not proud of it that we have conquered and overcome one of the most disgusting total uh, dictatorship in the world, which operated a world empire? And this, indeed, this is an event of success and an event of joy and a celebration. And we either don't speak about it or we are shy or we say that there was no communism, there was no total dictatorship, that was not such or not such. So Ronald Reagan has a statue in Budapest, which people adore. In Berlin, you can't have a statue for Ronald Reagan. The name of Chancellor Kohl, you practically can't uh, utter in Germany. In Hungary, she, he is much more appreciated than in Germany. I haven't seen in Frankfurt, Berlin, or anywhere, or any German city, a uh, place would be called after him or he would have a statue. And Willy Brandt and Helmut there are plenty of streets and names. So this again shows something that the Chancellor of the Unity in Germany practically does not, is not mentioned in the public discourse. And as a last sentence, I would say, Pope John Paul II, that his role, the role of those freedom fighters who, to whom we owe thanks, the memory of these must be maintained and cherished and to give them thanks again and again. And I want to know, for example, in Germany, whether in Germany there were some whose name would be worthwhile to remember who did something either in June 1953, if possibly there were 600 dead, more or less so. But I don't know none of the names. I don't know the names of those who in 1988, 1989 were so brave in Germany. So perhaps a little bit more attention would be due to them. That would do good for all of us. It's good to be proud. Thank you so much uh, for the critical, but at the same time uh, optimistic and uh, positive, uh, nearly closing words. Of course, uh, I would like uh, to ask uh, Oplatka Andras to say the final closing word, because I think we have to have an outlook as well if uh, we are in a panel. And with my last question is, do you think that uh, Europe will grow together? Not everything developed as we would have liked it to have happened. Uh, people are disappointed also in the West, but uh, this uh, Willy Brandt's uh, famous uh, uh, saying, uh, uh, will Europe grow together? Uh, who 
will make it happen. I think Europe will grow together, but everything is just a matter of time. The difference is not as big as uh, Maria Schmidt would think. In a Swede, in a Dutch, in a Spaniard, in a French, uh, the national sentiments are any not any less than uh, in uh, the people here in Hungary or in Eastern Europe. Uh, if somebody uh, says this, that uh, a person does not know these countries, we did not uh, bring down the Soviet uh, Union here in Eastern Europe, but we took advantage of the situation when the Soviet Union got weak by itself and collapsed by itself. It was the, This was not a kind of a big national upheaval which led the people in 1989, but this, uh, this illusion and dissatisfaction with the oppressing system and dissatisfaction with the economic system. In uh, the book of Romšić, you can read that the Kadar system uh, by the uh, mid of uh, 1980s was relatively popular in Hungary and uh, masses were satisfied with him. And when the economic situation started to get worse, then uh, the situation for the uh, uh, for the communist regime became critical. So, had there been a national sentiment in 1989 here in Hungary, then how can you explain that this uh, big and great proud nation? And you know, uh, four years later, they voted for Dula Horn. So this could have been in explain unexplainable if that had been the case. Yes, everything will go together that fits together, but on a liberal basis, because liberalism is the personal freedom uh, and uh, the European nations, uh, this is what European nations uh, since the Enlightenment are fighting for for two and a half centuries. Things, if things are happening perfectly in Hungary, as Maria said, so why is Hungary at the 50th or 60th place in the ranking of competitiveness? Not everything is so perfect in this country so that we could say this like that. And yes, the Western liberal model should be followed because that means competition. And in the competition on a liberal base, the better will win. And those will win who are more suitable because this is the Western model and not that the uh, some selected uh, people uh, can be given the opportunity to uh, get, uh, uh, get on better in their lives. And if we are in politics, uh, uh, if we do politics on this uh, fundament, uh, then uh, the Baltic states, for example, that were departing uh, from a much less, uh, much worse situation than all the other Eastern European countries, then I'm sure that if, we, if they could do it, then I'm sure that uh, Europe will grow together. Thank you so much for the closing words of uh, Mr. Oplatka, and I think that this uh, panel that we actually voiced uh, various uh, views, this is uh, real proof as to what has happened in the past 30 years, 30 or 40 years ago such contradicting opinions could not have been worded. So this is democracy. This is what happened uh, also in the past 30 years. So thank you very much for all the panelists.